Good afternoon. We'll just give everyone a couple more seconds to join. Great. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Simon Coughlin. I'm an associate director here at Babel. Um, for those that don't know, Babel is a London based technology PR agency. We work with tech clients across multiple sectors, including e commerce and retail. Um, thank you very much for all of you for joining today. Um, please feel free to ask questions throughout the course of the conversation using the chat functionality on Zoom. Uh, I know a few of you have, have sent me some questions already, so it's going to be uh, a busy half hour or so. Um, I'd like to pay a special thank you to Luke Tugby, the editor of Retail Week. Thanks very much for joining us today, Luke. Uh, Retail Week um, is the UK's leading provider of retail industry news. The website alone has more than 100,000 unique users each month. Uh, subscribers are primarily retail company board members, senior managers, as well as retailers and investment analysts. Uh, Luke, you've been with uh, Retail Week for about six years, um, but just in the position of editor for 12 months or so. Mm. And what a 12 months it's been for the retail sector. How has the first year at the helm of Retail Week been? Yeah, it's been uh, manic, as you as you can imagine. I mean, a lot of retailers who we uh, work with have talked about how there's been sort of five years of change within five weeks. And certainly for me, I, I moved into the role in uh, in January last year and, you know, all of our best laid plans around our strategic um, direction of travel by way of our, our content just had to be ripped up within two months. And obviously, coronavirus became the the really big topic of, uh, of conversation so you know in the same way that our audience have had to adapt to, to what their customers want we've had to adapt our our content output to what retailers and, and our readers want so it's um it's been a journey but i think we've, we've learned an awful lot from it and uh, hopefully as a lot of our retailers will say we can um, emerge stronger as we go through this year and without wishing to ask you to, to state the obvious, in your view, who have been the main retail winners and losers? Obviously, there's been a huge impact on the kind of traditional retail, the high street retailers. So the likes of John Lewis, even yesterday, I know you were reporting on the fact that they mm -hmm. are planning to close even more stores. Um, and they are themselves predicting that by 2025, 70 percent of their sales are going to be online which is obviously a huge huge change from where we uh, were just two or three years ago so in your view luke who have been the main uh, retail winners and losers uh, i mean what, what what i would say i mean there's clearly a, a polarization and a, a distinction between uh, online and, and offline players um clearly there has been a a shift towards online shopping through this pandemic but i think it's probably slightly lazy just to say it's a case of online has done well and, and offline has suffered um online has definitely benefited without a doubt but i think so of specialists we've seen people like b and q pets at home home base have all done pretty strongly through the pandemic value players people like b m and home bargains have all performed well um but i think there's a, a few areas i'd pull out where retailers have uh, succeeded and characteristics, if you like, that, that make up the ones that, that have succeeded. I think in the main that the winners have really um, put people before profit, that they've thought about their staff and their customers more than the bottom line. Um, I think they've done good in their communities. They've donated what they can to charity, whether that be finances or food waste, whatever it might be. Um, I think they've communicated with their shoppers in the right way. It's not been about trying to sell the stuff it's about um reassuring their customer base that you know we are here for you in whatever way shape or form you need us through this pandemic and i think they've um as i talked about before they've adapted their propositions to, to what their customers want um i won't go into too many names but i think morrison's is one that, that stands out for me particularly as someone who um covered the grocery sector for a number of years before becoming editor i think they've done a great job of um really focusing on vulnerable and elderly customers i think they were one of the first grocers to launch a, a telephone ordering service because clearly there's a number of older customers who have probably never used online shopping before and probably found it quite a, a daunting 
prospect. So uh, offering that telephone service was a, a game changer there. Um, they've launched things like themed food boxes um, that encourage people to make events at home around things like VE Day and, and Halloween. Um, and also those boxes just made it easier for people to um, stock up on, on certain supplies during the pandemic and at a lower cost as well. So I think it's, it's retailers like Morrison's and some of the others that I've mentioned that have genuinely listened to their customers and put them first who have emerged as winners and will continue to do so as we come out of the pandemic. And um, without necessarily naming brands, um, are there any retailers you think have perhaps done something wrong or taken the, the wrong strategy? I know, for example, Primark um, has continued to have this strategy of um, sticking to bricks and mortar, not going online. Do you see any clear examples of how retailers could have done something differently? To be honest, I'd actually applaud Primark for what they've what they've done in terms of sticking to their guns as a bricks and mortar only business. I mean, B and M is another that I pulled out as one of the the winners there, and 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 they you know they don't have an online operation either. I think it would have been quite easy to knee jerk into that decision during the pandemic, but clearly for someone like a Primark or indeed a B and M who um, are all about value it, it could easily become margin dilutive and, and impact the business in the long run so you know it's, it's, a, it's a keen debate that we've had in the office plenty of times whether Primark should go online but I think they've actually got it right so far by by not doing so um, I think I'd pull out people like ASOS as well who you know people who really have got it right yes they are an online only business and, and they should have benefited through this but Clearly, fashion has been one of the most impacted sectors. And if you compare ASOS with someone like uh, Ted Baker, for instance, you know, ASOS pushed into loungewear really quickly at the start of the pandemic and realised that people were going to be spending a lot more time at home and therefore they wanted um, a different kind of apparel. You know, they weren't going to be wearing um, chinos and shirts like you would normally be wearing to the office. And if you compare that, with someone like Ted Baker, if you, if you go on their website and look at their idea of casual wear, it's, it's a £99 jumper and, and clearly people aren't, aren't going to be buying those sorts of products at the moment. Um, so, the, you know, the people that have got it right have been the ones that have trusted that, that, that you know, and had, had courage in their convictions in terms of their strategy um, and listened to their customers and, and, and adapted their proposition and their business model to suit. Now, a lot of the people that we've had tuned in today um, work in the retail tech sector and also e-commerce. From a kind of traditional high street perspective, I think when at the end of the, the first lockdown last year, when we were going back onto the high street, we may have seen a few examples of how technology was being used to allow these stores to reopen in terms of counting the number of people, um, obviously the hygiene um, aspects in terms of screens, um, vac uh, cl uh, cleanliness when you're going into the store. Mm -hmm. Do you see the role of technology, particularly on the high street, playing an increasingly important role um, come the end of the next lockdown this year? I think it will do, yeah. I mean, you, you mentioned a few things there um, that have already become prevalent over the last year or so. And I mean, the return of the QR code, uh, who, who saw that coming uh, this, this time a year ago? But um, I think by way of the, the high street, I think um, the role of technology in genuinely combining physical and digital is going to be key. It's been talked about for a long time, um, but I think over the past year, we've seen that accelerate. Um, retailers like H&M and, and Zara, for instance, have invested quite heavily in um, technology that gives them a much greater oversight of um, inventory management, if you like. They can see where their stock is at any one time. Um, and that helps them obviously with online orders as well, because if they can fulfill an order from a store that is maybe only two or three miles away from a, a customer's home, as opposed to a distribution center that might be 30 miles away, things like that can genuinely be um, game changing for a business. Um, I think we'll also start to see things like, um, you know, people like Klarna offering um, the, the buy now pay later proposition that's been largely focused around online so far but I think we might start to see that coming into stores more and more um, so there are you know there are absolutely loads of ways that, that this technology can really 
um, help boost a, a bricks and mortar business. Um, I think the key is making sure that it's not just tech for tech's sake and that it's um, technology that will genuinely either help at the back end and improve efficiencies for retailers and their workforces or make a real difference to um, the customer journey. You know, does it make things more convenient, quicker, safer? Um, if the answer is no, then do, do you really need it? I think that's the big question that, that retailers will be asking themselves. Um, we often see through the media the kind of store of the future vision, uh, what the stores will look like in five, ten years time. Uh, they, they often talk about augmented reality, virtual reality. In your view, how far off in the UK, for example, are we from seeing the likes of AR and VR um, in on the high street? Again, I think it comes back to the point I made there, which is it, it's not just retailers don't just want tech for take, tech's sake. They want something that is genuinely going to help their customers. And at the moment, from the examples of those things I've seen, it feels very much like it's, I, I don't know, it's, I, I don't think that is aiding the customer and making the journey easier for the you know you look at someone like asda and they're having um you know holograms and augmented reality bits and pieces in in one of their stores i think it's in stevenage and if you're doing a grocery shop are you really going to when you're picking up your can of beans are you really going to stop and stare at a hologram for 10 minutes i, I don't think you are um it, so it feels very much like these are nice to have propositions at the moment um you know bells and whistles as opposed to things that are, are genuinely going to keep a customer coming back um, that, that, don't get me wrong, there's been one or, one or two good examples, you know, I, IKEA use augmented reality quite well, but that's on their app and that allows you to, you know, see what a sofa or a desk might look like within your living room. So I think things like that can work really well, but I must admit, I, I, I don't see many examples in UK stores where I think that is AR or VR being used to really good effect to genuinely help the customer. In, in terms of the post lockdown environment, I think customer experience is going to be increasingly import, uh, important for retailers as they try to attract people back onto the high street. Do you see any particular elements or types of technology which will be um, best used within stores to increase or enhance customer experience? I think combining the two combining the physical and, and digital is going to be to be really key and i think the people that have got it right through the pandemic i think customers would generally sort of try and gravitate back to i mean i look at dixon's car phone as a good example of this um and we've used a couple of their new technologies they had a uh, shop live uh, video service where you could connect to one of their uh, store staff members and you know if you're spending a, a sum in three or, or four figures on new technology you know you, you want to be able to have some real advice and you want that reassurance that you're spending the right amount of money on, on the right product so i think to have that has been great and then they also had a um you know a drive through click and collect proposition which we used and was fantastic you know you, you'd pick a window where you want to go in and collect you pull up in a numbered bay you send them a, a quick message to say i'm in bay two pop your boot and someone comes out and delivers your, your order you don't you know it's safe you don't have to get out and come into contact with anyone um so i think retailers that have done things like that during the pandemic you know me as a customer i will genuinely feel better now about going back to, to curry's pc world because i know the uh, the service that they gave me through um the, you know through the pandemic um, in, in terms of the in-store um, proposition and, and how tech is used, I, I, I mean, we did a feature on this last week, actually, and I genuinely think a lot of the, the game-changing technology that we see in stores is going to be in the back end where customers don't even necessarily really see it. Um, there's huge investment at the moment from a lot of retailers going into um, a lot of their HR type processes, so allowing people to uh, individual stores to manage their own rotors and things like this which just improve efficiency from from the back end and allow um, store staff to focus on much more important tasks the customer facing tasks and as a result because they can spend more time with the customer engaging with them giving them the advice they might need that just makes that whole in-store shopping experience much better from a consumer perspective 
Um, I've had a, a couple of questions in. Um, this one is looking at blending physical with digital um, in the retail space. Most retailers now appear to have a strong Omni offering. Are you seeing retailers blend physical with digital from a sales pers performance perspective? Retailers have always spoken about this and combining the best of, of physical and, and digital. And again, I, I'm not sure anyone has properly got it right in, in the UK market. Um, you, you see some really good examples in in China. You know, they're, they're a bit ahead of us in the COVID curve. And you look at how they are reopening at the moment and they're, they are giving reasons for people to go back to a store you know online they will be you know they will offer you vouchers to say if you go into store you will get 20 percent off or um or they might run an event in store and then give you a voucher to then spend online so it's that it's the combination of the two that that you allude to there that i don't think um the uk has really properly got to grips with yet um i think what we will increasingly see more of is maybe less stock um, within actual stores almost being and again this has been talked about a lot but being used slightly more as as showroom type spaces places to uh, engage with customers interact with customers build your brand um, and then having you know your, your digital screens and whatnot in store to then order the product you want to be delivered to your home in that sort of showroom physical meets digital environment I think that's something that we we will see more of and actually i think that's a really good opportunity for people like asos and boohoo who are you know buying high street brands and are choosing at the moment not to take their physical space but i think there could be a real opportunity there to say well actually you know if you're asos we're going to keep the top shop on oxford circus and we're going to make it that engaging showroom type space that then pushes people through to the online channel in order to actually make purchases we spoke earlier briefly about the Primark example, the fact they haven't moved online. Do you see retailers in the next two to five years without an e-commerce e offering being able to survive or is a, an omni-channel approach the only way forward? I, I wouldn't say it was the only way forward, but I think increasingly retailers will come to terms with the fact that we need some kind of digital proposition um, I mentioned earlier with Primark that for them, you know, if they were to launch their own website tomorrow and, and try and sell all of their products themselves, it, it would be margin dilutive because, you know, they, they are keen on value. They can't afford to raise their prices. But in order to make a profit online, that's inevitably, I think, what they would need to do. Um, B&M was another example I, I used earlier and we actually I'm probably saying too much here but we actually heard that they were about to launch uh, an online proposition prior to the pandemic and they actually shelved um, that idea because because the pandemic set in but that was only going to be for the, the, the higher ticket items so things like garden furniture and things like that that they sell um, so I, I think people will look for more creative ways like that you know can they sell just parts of the proposition that do make sense and stack up financially or if you're someone like Primark where everything is really really keen on price who can you partner with you know can Primark start to supply some of its products to ASOS to Boohoo to Zalando um, and start to sell that way because I think ultimately you know we have seen a lot of the market move online during the pandemic and I think in the next two to five years that that time frame that you allude to online penetration will continue to go up um, so I, I think retailers are going to, to have to respond to that ultimately but it's just about finding creative ways and, and finding the right partners um, to do that to make sure that the bottom line stacks up at the same time. Another question in um, on the topic of selling via video what's your view Luke on um, the growth of dark stores or studios that sell via video? Well, I mentioned China earlier, and actually this is something that we see a, a lot of it in, in some of those um, eastern countries. And, you know, China has done that an awful lot and to really good effect during the pandemic. And I, I can see that coming here eventually. It, it might take a, a little longer than, than maybe we thought initially, but I, I, I can certainly see it 
having a big future here you know qvc still exists over here and we you know we've got a few other tele shopping channels that you can flick to on, on freeview so there is an appetite for it and i think increasingly through the advent of social media platforms like tiktok it's, it's opening that way of selling up to a, a younger and broader audience um we've only seen just today actually that um shopify has, has done a, a deal with with tiktok over in the uk having tested it in, in the us so it, the bigger companies like shopify like amazon are are seeing that as, as a keen route to market now and it's it's an engaging route to market i mentioned dixon's car phone earlier and just having that two five ten minute chat with um, a store staff member just to get the reassurance you need before purchasing a product i think having um video ordering if you like and video selling can work in in much the same way you know you can offer demonstrations and things like that which um, really appeal to a customer particularly if you're spending a decent amount of money on something lots of questions coming in um keep them um coming in through the chat functionality um this one focuses on uh, the fact we're already seeing huge amounts of money being spent on trying to get customers through the door uh, in terms of investments in niche events promotions are you seeing retailers invest in tools that improve the performance of store associates uh, and if so which tools so the big one is the one i um or the area that i talked about earlier which is anything in the sort of hr realm and i think rotor management seems to have been a, a really key one it just it it puts control in, in the hands of each individual store and it saves a lot of manual effort you know having to go back to a computer or you know writing things on paper in in the old-fashioned way just for everyone to be able to manage their rotors via their mobile phone i think has been huge for for a lot of uh, a lot of stores and a lot of store staff during this um and i think just any technology that will allow them to get information on, on the products that they are selling at their at their fingertips you know if that's carrying um a, an ipad a tablet around a store um if a customer asks a question you know they can dip in and, and gain the information they need and then potentially even place an order for, for the customer there and then you know apple do this to, to great effect and um dixon's car phone is starting to do more of it i think we'll we'll see that coming through into into other sectors as well be that fashion or or home and diy i think that's definitely got a, a big future got a question now on the topic of finance um clearly we've seen a growing number of fintech specialists so you mentioned the, the likes of klarna um come into the retail space the question says, what role do you feel retail finance will play in retailers' approach to point of sale over the coming year? And to what extent do you feel the pandemic has impacted its uptake? It's an interesting one. Obviously, there's a, um, a bit of a crackdown on some of these companies at the moment, and the FCA are talking about slightly more um, regulation around it. Um, I, I think a lot of these companies have actually done fairly well during the pandemic i don't know the numbers exactly offhand but um i seem to remember in klarna's most recent update towards the back end of last year that they talked about some huge year-on-year -year growth in terms of um the downloads of their app i think it was well over 100 percent and i think that the gross merchandise volume that was going through their apps had gone up by almost 50 percent um so clearly there is a, an appetite for you know these different methods of, of payment and as i said before i think they will increasingly come into play in stores not just um online um I, I think if if there has been that sort of level of uptake online and and as i said before we're living in a time when retailers want to blend the physical and the digital it, it would seem odd to offer a, a way of payment online and not try to replicate that in a store if you can so i don't think it will be too long before we start to see um customers going to a till with their phone and being able to to buy now pay later in a physical environment as well as a, an online environment sticking um with a technology question another question on the uh, subject of video selling um Luke, you mentioned uh, that dixon's car phone warehouse are using this tactic there are others like sophology and ribble 
um, using video um, technology. Do you see this persisting as a kind of third channel post pandemic? I think it will, yes. I mean, it, as I say, I think it will, it will take a little while before it becomes mainstream, if you like, in the UK. But I think given the the growing influence of, of people like TikTok, you know, things like Instagram stories and the, the plethora of, uh, of influencers that, that we have on those channels, I think that's going to um, continue just to, to grow within the consciousness of the of the younger consumer, at least probably not for myself. I'm maybe slightly too old for that now. But I think if you're, you know, 25, 26 or, or below, it, that's just going to become the norm. And, and you're going to see products that you want to buy through TikTok or Instagram or wherever it might be. And, and, and the demand is going to be there to buy that product there and then. And if the customer wants it, ultimately, I, I think retailers are going to have to learn and, and do what they can to, to provide that. Thanks, Luke. So just leaving the, the technology focus questions to one side for a moment, focusing more on uh, communication. Uh, we've got a lot of PR marketing communication specialists um, joining us today. Um, obviously, a lot of us want to get on, onto the pages and, and the website of, of Retail Week. Um, can you give us uh, a few examples of the way that retailers and retail tech companies have been communicating um, with you over the past year and, and has that changed at all? It's a good question. I'm not, I'm not sure if we've seen a, a, a huge change. I think there's been communication feels a bit more direct. I think in the past we might have had some, you know, releases that were slightly more um, fluffy, shall we say, but I think people are, are getting much more to the point now. They understand that everyone is um, hard pressed for time. You know, the people that are writing these releases as much as the people that are reading them. And therefore I think a, a lot of the, um, the, the waffle, shall we say, has been cut out and people are getting much more to the point. Um, a lot of the, one tactic I have seen a lot of people uh, start to include actually at the start of press releases is just a headline and then three or four bullet points. Um, and that that works really well for us because when we are short on time, you really can just pick out the three or four things that you expect to read if you want to read on in, in you know the rest of the release. And it, it is a real time saver for us because we can decide within 15 or 20 seconds of opening an email, yes, this is of interest or, or no, it isn't. So I, I would definitely encourage people to do more of that because it certainly helped us from a, a retail week perspective. Uh, that's really interesting. And I think the question of how we best engage with your, your editorial team is crucial. It's always been the kind of uh, $64,000 question in, in PR about how we can best um, engage with journalists. Um, what's your view on the best way to, to kind of sell a story or pitch a story into your editorial team? Is it through the kind of traditional press release? Do you mind your journalist picking up the phone and, and speaking with PR as PRs or is that, is that just, um, would you prefer that us to, to leave your team alone? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, to be honest, I, I always encourage my team to get on the phone a lot more because it's, it's by having a genuine conversation on the phone when, you know, you might take a tangent or a detour in a conversation and you pick up some new information that uh, an email chain might not have delivered. So, you know, I would certainly not discourage anyone from picking up the phone to, to Retail Week. Um, what I would say is that, you know, we are, we always have been, but we are right now hugely busy and, we're, you know, we're a fairly small team. So um, I think when it comes to press releases, like with their, they're a more than welcome method of, of communication. What I would really encourage people to do is just try and genuinely stand out from the crowd as much as you can. Uh, speaking personally, I'd probably get somewhere between three and 400 emails a day. Um, you know, clearly I'm never gonna get around to reading all of them because that would be my entire job otherwise. So what is it that, that sets you apart from other companies and, and as I said, those, those three or four bullet points really work wonders for that. Um, you know, give us as many good stats and um, short, sharp, but important case studies as you can about how your tech might be benefiting other retailers. Um, and the other thing for me really is do this in, in layman's terms. Um, so many companies fall into the trap of um, 
I guess, trying too hard to, to talk up their product and it just becomes full of jargon that, you know, we, we are not tech experts. We are, you know, we're embedded in the retail sector. We understand retail really well, but we don't for one minute claim to be technology experts. So lay it out in the simplest possible way that you can um, so that even, you know, tech phobes like uh, George McDonald, who's our executive editor, he won't mind me saying this at all, but, you know, he's uh, in his 50s. He's, you know, he's barely just got to grips with uh, with reading WhatsApp. So, you know, how, how would you explain your technology to someone like George? Um, and, and, you know, that that will go a long way, really, to to helping us separate the, the wheat from the chaff when we're going through those those sorts of emails. And you mentioned case studies. Um, obviously, a lot of the, the tech companies that we work with are very keen to speak with you about their technology and their solutions. How important is it that um, we're able to put your team in touch with not just the vendors, but also the end user? Yeah, that's huge. Um, really important. Um, we to be like completely sort of clear and honest and transparent we, we don't often write um technology stories as news stories but we will look for ways to include them into our feature content and deep dive content so you know i mentioned the feature that we wrote last week about um where is the genuine tech transformation happening right now and, and a lot of that was in the the back end you know the, the non-customer facing end um so any way that you you can really bring the tech to life and say you know these are the the people that we've helped and it, i don't know it might be the cio from dixon's car phone or something you know we've worked really closely with them and, and they'd be really happy to speak to you about it if you want some more information knowing that we've already got those people potentially um you know lined up as potential contributors to our content um is you know is really good for us to know so yeah the more that, that you can do that the better i would say Great. We've had a question in about the, the topic of influencers. Do you see retailers moving away from influencers and using their own employees more frequently to do things such as associate live streaming? Good question. Um, I mean, people like I've referred to them on numerous occasions, but Dixon's Carphone obviously used their own store staff. I think a lot of um, health and beauty businesses are using their their own staff you know people that will do um you know that they do your makeup in store or do your eyebrows in store whatever it might be they're just transferring those skills online um so i think in a lot of cases you are seeing existing staff just taking that advice and, and moving it into a, a digital channel as opposed to a physical one um on the other hand, you've got a lot of brands like Gymshark, for instance, who, you know, that's a business that was built really on on influencers and, and building a real community through social media. Um, and I think, if anything, they've just upped the ante, really, in terms of how much they lean on those influencers through the pandemic and, and using those people as a way of getting in front of that community and saying, you know, we're still here for you. You can still order online. We're still going to be um having pop-ups you know when we're when we're allowed to get back into a physical environment um and leading things like daily workouts as well to help people's um health and well-being so um i wouldn't necessarily say there's been a um you know a, a case of retailers turning their their back on influencers i think it's just been um you know the, the business has looked at it on a case-by-case -case basis um and and seen where the, the real expertise lie and um, got to grips with what, what their customers want from those video interactions and, and made a decision on that basis. Moving on to um, the types of stories that you're perhaps tired of hearing about, are there any stories which you, you're just, um, you'd rather not hear about from, from PR teams or anything you want to hear about more, particularly with, with regards to the use of technology? there's nothing that springs immediately to mind that i'm i'm, I'm bored of hearing about um that there's certain words that we're bored of you know pivot has been used so much over the past 12 months um you know things like acceleration which i've probably even used myself uh, throughout this call but i think and any kind of technology any kind of digital innovation that is genuinely making a difference to a business we want to hear about we want to know about um, so I, I, I genuinely wouldn't discourage anyone from pitching anything to us. It, it, it's all about, for me, just making 
making it really clear what benefits the technology is is bringing to retail or could bring to retail and why we should be sitting up and and taking notice of it that's the key for me but yeah i wouldn't yeah there's nothing that i would say to to pr companies please don't talk to us about this anymore um because there's so much change going on you know as i said before who would have sat here a year ago and said that the qr code was going to get the, the sort of renaissance that it has over the past 12 months so i think we you know we'd be stupid as a as a publication to to close our doors on on anything in particular i think that that's you know we've certainly been taught that over the last 12 months another question come in um about the use of whatsapp brochures by Bista. Do you see places like Bista continuing with WhatsApp brochures and personal shopping when their stores reopen? What do you think will stick post-pandemic? It, it comes back to a point I made before, I think, and um, just deciphering what your customer wants. I think Bista Village and, and personal shopping are two things that probably go hand in hand you know if you've got you've got a lot of affluent customers shopping there and and to feel like you are getting that personal tailored service i think you know th th those sorts of people that are spending big money will, will really um appreciate that that level of one-to-one of -one service so i must admit i'm not familiar with the um the whatsapp brochures that, that they're sending out i've not seen any of those um but again, it comes back to what, what difference does that make to the customer? Does that make their journey easier? Does it make it more convenient? And, and if they're finding from their feedback that the answer is yes, then absolutely continue it. But if it's something that they're not really finding value in, then they'll probably start to ask themselves, is it working? Is it worth our time? And, and could we be better placed putting that time and energy into other areas? Question in uh, on the... Uh, topic of retail ethics and brand governance is a topic which is um, being increasingly covered by the media. Uh, things like how retailers treat their employees, um, uh, the topic of, of fast fashion as well. So in light of this increased focus, as a publication, are you spending more time scrutinising brands, including the way in which they treat employees and their management of supply chains? I don't know if uh, scrutinising it is the right word, but, but what I would say is that we did a um, quite a big uh, piece of work a few months ago uh, called Retail Horizon. Um, within that, we pulled out what we sort of saw as our five winning strategies for retailers and brands uh, over the course of the next couple of years. Um, and a couple of those strands were uh, culture and purpose um, and also brand relevance and, and evolution. And I think clearly that the role of people and the way that you treat people falls smack bang in the middle of, of both of those areas. I think retailers um, are well aware that um, that has rapidly evolved um, over the last 12 to 24 months in particular. Um, we have a, a content advisory board that a lot of senior retail leaders sit on. Um, we held the first one this year just a couple of weeks ago and um, the whole point around people came through loud and clear um, one of the retailers put it at the um, and he meant this in the broadest possible way but the contract between employer and employee has changed rapidly but it's changed for the better um, so I think retailers will need to look increasingly hard at what that means and how that plays out so it's not just about pay and how much holiday you give people but it's you know it's about those working conditions um and at a time when when retail staff have been pulled out as being some of the key workers in this pandemic they're going to increasingly expect um you know respect from their employees and and good working conditions from their employees um as regards to the, the supply chain specifically you know clearly that's been in the in the headlines not just over the past year but Beyond that as well, you know, you look at the controversies around Boohoo in, in Leicester in particular, you know, these things are almost constantly in the in the limelight. But I, what I would say is that I think a lot of retailers are looking forensically at their supply chain in a way that they probably haven't before. Um, clearly, you've got the impact of, of Brexit. Um, and then what this COVID pandemic has also served to do is, is show retailers that actually they probably need to bring their supply chains a bit closer to home and, and shorten them as much as they can um, so that they can avoid 
disruption to their supply chains and to the flow of product into stores and into their distribution centers. So um, I think there's going to be quite a big overhaul of um, supply chains in general across retail over the next five to 10 years. And I think within that, retailers are going to look really heavily at, at how everyone in that supply chain, whether they are people directly employed by themselves or whether they're you know a third party supplier etc i think they're going to look really really carefully at all of that because they know it will reflect well or, or badly on, on their brand thanks luke um, we've come to the end of all the questions that have been sent in if you do have any more questions any topics that you'd like um, luke to cover then and do send them in um, so just, just to wrap up luke um, hopefully we're now coming towards the end of the lockdown, um, certainly in the UK. Mm. Um, hopefully by the summer, we will be almost um, back to normality, touch wood. Um, what do you see as being the major trends for the retail sector throughout the rest of this year and into 2022? Well, we've talked about it a lot, but I think the finding ways to genuinely combine the physical and the digital channels, I think will be huge. Um, people, another one that I touched on there, I think you know, the retailers that have, have done well um, through this pandemic are the ones that have genuinely been seen to put people before profit. And I think not just through this pandemic, but beyond, I think consumers will start to gravitate to those companies that, that have a real keen people focus. Um, and for me, online is going to be the, the big area. And by online, I mean everything associated with that channel, including supply chain. Um, you know, for, for businesses like the grocers, for example, you know, the, the Tesco's and Sainsbury's of this world, they had almost seen the online channel until now as just a, a bit of a land grab. And they just, you know, they put it out there and had cheap deliveries and, and just wanted to get people in and, and build market share. Um, Tesco, I think, has about a 50% share of the online food market, so it's dominant there. But if you now look at Tesco's overall sales, comparing the different channels, I think online now accounts for about 15 or 16% of its total sales. So that's, that's clearly a, a big chunk. So the difference that this pandemic has made is that it's gone from being a, a land grab and a potentially uh, margin dilutive part of the business that they could afford to take a hit on because it was just all about getting people through the, the virtual door as it were um, but now it's reached such a level that they can't afford for it to be profit dilutive anymore they need it to wipe its feet and, and make a contribution to to the bottom line so I think there's going to be a lot of time a lot of investment um, plowed into those digital channels and, and making sure that they are profitable because ultimately such as the, the penetration of online shopping now if you can't make your e-commerce division profitable when it's slowly losing money then you're you know you're on a, a ticking clock really so i think that's a, a key area that a lot of retailers are going to have to focus on in the next few years in particular great thank you luke i think that brings us to the end of discussion um i just want to say thank you again very much luke for uh, joining us today it's been a, a fascinating uh, discussion and thanks very much to everyone for joining us on the line uh, a recording of um, this webinar along with a written summary will be on the Babel website uh, in the coming days um, if you've got any further questions for myself or any of the Babel, Babel team um, then drop me a line and thank you very much again speak to you soon <laughs>